Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Churches Together in Britain and Ireland and Baptist Union of Great Britain's webinar tonight. I'm very excited to be having this talk. We've got an excellent speaker tonight. Really, really excited about the questions that you're also going to be bringing and engaging with us tonight. This is one of several sessions dedicated to issues of racism and social injustice in um, Great Britain. Uh, my name is Elisa Phoenix Louis. I'll be hosting tonight's session and my aims, my goals, my objectives are to welcome you firstly to say that uh, you're very welcome. We're happy to have you. We really want to hear your questions that so make sure you've got paper, pen, take your notes and listen eagerly. And then secondly is also to introduce our speaker for tonight. Mm -hmm. Following his talk, I will be taking your questions bringing them to our speaker and hopefully stirring a really, really exciting and provocative conversation. Tonight's talk focuses on the hostile environment policy um, that was put forward by the creative-led government, conservative-led government, implanting this policy that created distrust, increased discrimination and deprivation among those with an insecure immigration status in this country. This populist policy, which tapped into the growing anti-immigration status in this country, aimed to build on the fortress Britain island nation attitude. What should the church's theological re response be to this issue? That's our question tonight. And tonight we have Robert Beckford, professor of black theology, religion and culture, award-winning documentary filmmaker, author and creative director. How are you doing, Robert? Good to uh, see you tonight. It's fantastic to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for Churches Together in Britain and Ireland and the Baptist Union for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Really excited about what you're going to be sharing with us tonight. So you've got about 15 minutes. I'm going to be getting in. So everybody who's engaged tonight, please send your answers into the question and answer box. I'll be taking notes and doing it my best as possible to get through those questions. Robert, I'm going to hand over to you. We're really excited about what we have. Thank you. Thank you very much. And good evening, everybody. I've got about 15 minutes to talk about the church's response to the hostile environment. What I want to do is top and tail it with some theological ideas. The four points that I've got, um, and the, the, the first and the last really relate to uh, theology and the Christian church. So first thing I want to do is, is just alert us to what the Bible has to say about the treatment of immigrants and foreigners within the land. If I was in church now, I'd say, open your Bible. In terms of, but anyway, Leviticus 19. 33 to 34, you've probably heard this verse before, but it says, when a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him or her wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him, her, as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I'm the Lord your God. Do what is just and right. Four things kind of strike me about that verse. Firstly, that immigration is the issue of justice. The sojourner in the land is to be treated with justice and um, honorably, honorably. Second thing is, you're supposed to love the immigrant in the same way that you love yourself. It's asking for more than justice, it's asking for some kind of empathy and connectedness with the sojourner, with the immigrant, with the stranger. You're also meant to be compassionate towards them, you're meant to open up your bowels of compassion and feel for their state and the difficulties that they may be experiencing. And finally, there's a sense of equity to treat these people exactly the same way as you expect to be treated within the land. So I just want to open that up straight away, that the Bible says some pretty revolutionary things about how you're meant to treat strangers within your midst with justice, love, compassion, and um, equality. It's quite a high bar that is set in the Old Testament, where in the ancient world it was quite normal to do the stranger in. The God of Israel is asking the Hebrews to consider a higher calling, a higher uh, um, understanding of what it means to, to welcome and to have a, a spirit of hospitality. So that's the first point, just framing what the biblical text says about immigration. Second thing that I want to mention is Theresa May, because Theresa May is seen as the architect of the hostile environment. But I want to kind of challenge whether she is really the architect. She declared in an interview in 2012 in the Daily Telegraph that she wanted to create, quote, a really hostile environment 
the irregular migrants in the UK. I can't do a Theresa May accent, unfortunately. I'm trying to have a go, but I, I, just, I, just, I just can't knock it out. But what I wanted is only question whether or not she was actually the architect of the hostile environment from an African Caribbean perspective. And the reason why I say this is because if you're African Caribbean or from the African diaspora, there's a longer history of Britain being a hostile environment. We could go back to 1948 and the experience of the Windrush generation, even before, possibly even before Theresa May was born, she was maybe in a, in a, in a diapers, a nappies for our British listeners. 1940s, when, Empire, when the Empire Windrush docks in Tilbury in 1948, British government is up, up in arms, really worried about the potential of these, the possibility of these immigrants, colonial citizens, uh, when immigrants, colonial citizens from the West Indies settling in Britain. So in order to stop them from coming, they created a hostile environment. For example, Winston James and Clive Harris in their book, reflecting on this period, talk about three things that the British government did covertly. They sent people out to the West Indies to docks and told people that there were no jobs in England, creating a hostile environment, don't come, there are no jobs. For people who did come here, they catalogued some of the things that were done at the labour exchanges before the job centre to ensure that West Indian labourers felt really uncomfortable in Britain and so that they'd go back home. It's a classic story. One of the classic stories is they sent 20 West Indian men who literally just gone off the plane to Glasgow in the middle of winter to find work. I mean, you know, you're going to send Jamaicans or Barbadians back to back home. You know, you send them to Glasgow in the middle of winter, you stand a good chance of making sure that they end up going back home. They talk about the fact that they also ensured that in housing, at local and municipal level, things were made difficult for people. So they couldn't get the good stock of housing that was available, even though there was limited stocks during the post-war experience. A great experience of that uh, in Birmingham, where uh, there was housing set aside for West for colonial subjects in the north of the city, but the people objected, Mr. Council listened to their objections and they ended up pushing them to a different part of the city, which became the Hansworth district where black people, West Indians um, initially settled. So there was a hostile environment in the 1940s, but it doesn't stop there. You can go back even further to the 1920s after the rioting that took place after racial attacks on black seamen in Cardiff and in, in Liverpool, the British government came up with this law, the Coloured Seamen's Act, in the middle of the 1920s. And it basically said that if you were a seaman in Cardiff, Liverpool, Bristol, or London, and a person of colour, and you didn't have your papers to demonstrate that you were in, illegally in the country, you got kicked out. That kind of sound, sound familiar, it's in 1925, you know? So it was used by the police to harass black and brown people, black and brown seamen. Hostile environment. 1920s, look, if you're as old as me, you can remember the tragic story in the 1990s of Joy Gardner. Jamaican woman is in Britain illegally, the immigration officers broke down the front door, put her in handcuffs and in a, a, a leather straight jacket, as if that wasn't enough. They then bound her with several yards of tape around her mouth and head so she couldn't breathe, she suffocated and died. Hostile environment. So the second thing I wanna say is, you know, hostile environment isn't new. This has been going on for a long time, which suggests that when we think about the present predicament, we need to put it in a longer frame so we can think more critically about what's happening in our history in regards to the stranger and welcome. It isn't just about the hostile environment, it's quite unique. It's a longer history. Third thing I want to um, say then is to talk a little bit more then about the current hostile environment and just go through what it is before thinking about what this means for us as Christian people in terms of um, responding to it. So hostile environment was a label originally applied to the set of policies by its architect, the Home Secretary in 2012. The hostile environment includes measures to limit access to work, housing, health care, bank accounts and more. And, it, and what really kind of distinguishes this, I think, from other forms of hostility 
is the citizen on citizen immigration check. And we'll get to that a little bit later on because you will probably experience that if you, you try to do a little, little bit of work on the side and they ask you to show your papers and uh, we'll, we'll get to that. So let's just run down what this actually is to show how embedded it is within the legal system, within our culture now, because that may signpost what we need to do to get rid of it. Um, so look, there are, we're talking about the hostile environment, there are plenty of aspects to the current immigration policy, which are, which are deeply unpleasant, unpleasant and hostile uh, to immigrants and uh, migrants in general. So it's the things that, that this actually involves. Firstly, it includes an astronomically high immigration application fee. If you've uh, had to work with anybody trying to work through this whole process, you'll know it runs into thousands of pounds. I had a colleague who wanted to, from America, he had to renew his um, status for himself, his wife and his family. And in the end, he worked out, he just wasn't worth it financially paying these huge amounts of money to the British government uh, every year just to stay in the country. It's incredibly uh, uh, um, expensive to become a resident in this, in this country. There is also the question of indefinite detention. We know about that, how difficult and how terrible that can be. Uh, there's also the complexity of the rules. Uh, I don't think I'm that uh, you know, and able to work my, work my way through government papers, but some of the rules are incredibly easy, a PhD in law, to understand them, much less if English is your second language, trying to negotiate the complexity. And then there's the tragedy of enforced separation of some families. So it's a pretty hostile environment. And to add to all of that, do you remember the go home vans that Theresa May uh, implemented as well? It's all part of creating this hostile environment. Uh, Trees Mesa kind of recurring, recurring trope in this talk uh, because, um, not only because she was the architect, but also, is she an Anglican? Uh, I'm kind of intrigued, you know, I see all those pictures of Trees May and her husband coming out of church on Sunday, and I'm kind of intrigued. How do you go to church on Sunday, worship a God of justice, freedom, inclusion, love, mercy, compassion, grace? on Sunday, not Monday, developing a hostile environment policy. Uh, we come back to that at the end. Some kind of theological disconnect taking place there, which again, I think is part of a, a bigger problem that we need to deal with within this. As Theresa May is watching, look, I'm not having a go at you, love. I'm just uh, dealing with the position that you were in back in the day, you know, so please don't, don't feel offended by it. It's, um, uh, it. it is what it is. It's just part of the, um, the analysis here, if, if Theresa May is listening, because I know she's a big fan of um, Churches Together in Britain and Ireland and the Baptist Union, often sends her texts and uh, her good wishes in. So what was the purpose then of the hostile environment? Well, in her interview in 2012, Theresa May set out broad aims of the hostile environment. She said three things. One, to discourage people from coming to the UK, to stop those um, who do come from overstaying, and thirdly, to stop irregular migrants being able to access the essentials of an ordinary life. Go back to the original biblical point here again, where the biblical text is saying you're meant to treat the stranger the same way that you want to be treated. You're meant to treat them with love and compassion, empathy, to discourage people from coming to the stop those who, to prevent people having essential services. You know, two priorities that seem to shape this policy, to contribute to reducing net migration, we'll come to that because it didn't necessarily work, so net migration targets uh, might be reduced, and then to punish uh, irregular migrants uh, by marginalising, isolating and criminalising them because it was um, morally or legally right to do so. Wow. Again, I think about what the biblical text says, this is uh, completely juxtaposed to, uh, diametrically opposed to what the biblical text is saying. So how did this work out in practice? I just want to go through this to just show how it embedded it has become within our culture, this sense of hostility. Well, firstly, landlords. Uh, the Immigration Act of 2014 introduced a system in which landlords became immigration officers. A landlord would have to check an immigration, immigration papers of a potential or existing tenant against the list provided by the Home Office and refuse a tenancy or evict a tenant whose papers did not match to those on the list, the landlords became immigration officers. Similar thing happened in terms of banking. And back to my reoccurring trope, uh, Theresa May in a 2012 interview, she said, look, quote, if you're going to create a hostile environment for illegal migrants, access to financial services is part of that, unquote. 
Section 40 to 42 of the Immigration Act 2014 created a scheme intended to prevent people from opening bank accounts um, if they don't have permission to live in the UK. And banks and building societies were required to check the status of new issue potential customer with a specific anti-fraud organisation, specific data matching authority. So banks became part of the police force, but it didn't stop there. Uh, another area, if you were in the country and you wanted to get married, it became problematic. The Immigration Act of 2014 also introduced new requirements for marriage registrars to report suspected sham marriages and increase the notice period for all marriages to 15 to 28. This was a big problem for me because, you know, Rihanna was looking to come to the UK. She said, Robert, look, you know, I think we, we, we need to get together. I said, look, <laughs> people will recognise, baby, this is a sham. I, I just can't do this to keep, look, look, I need to take this seriously. It's a big problem. They actually disrupted even the potential of people getting married. Landlords, banking, marriage, even if you wanted to drive. The hostility is embedded in that. The Immigration Act 2014 conferred on the driver and vehicle license agency power to revoke a driving license when issued to a person who does not leave to, uh, to have leave to remain where a person's license is revoked on this basis, it is not open for them to argue in an appeal against, the, against, against it. And, and uh, <laughs> this, this, I, mean, I mean, you know, I'm laughing because this stuff is just so, you know, it's terrible. It, the hostility, deep-rooted, every aspect of life, innocent until proven guilty. This, this stuff is horrific. Let's just pull this together, policing. Metropolitan Police, uh, uh, National Police are in on, on this. Um, they confirmed a few years ago in response to the Freedom of Information Act um, that they pass on personal details regarding immigration st status. Even if people are, are victims of crime, there's some tragedies around this where people have been victims, brutalized, passed on their details, and then ended up being deported. Terrible stuff. Homelessness. Similar thing happening with homelessness. Similar thing happening with healthcare. We've heard about the terrible case of Albert Tom Thompson. Uh, he now goes by his, uh, his real name, Sylvester Marshall, was denied cancer treatment by his local hospital because they claimed he had unlawful uh, residency for 44 years. Been here 44 years paying rent, paying tax, but still denied uh, cancer treatment. They tried it within education. Those of us who are in higher education know that you have to uh, keep records. Universities have to be uh, much tighter in terms of who's allowed in the country, the way in which the immigration, the foreign students uh, are, are managed. And, and, our, and our police didn't work out in terms of secondary schools. There was an attempt to do this in 2016, but luckily that, that, that attempt was restricted. The idea was that, you know, it, it, teachers would become uh, immigration officers and they were suspicious about the immigration status of children in their school. They were to report it. That was, uh, that was done away with, uh, uh, thank God. So look, um, has this worked out? Well, the question is this, the hostile environment it is an attempt to discourage migration, but there's no evidence that it actually works. People still trying to get in. Uh, you know, people still not necessarily leaving involuntarily. And it doesn't seem to me that there are any real figures for um, a, a, a targets for people leaving, which was, suggests to me that this isn't really about controlling the flow of immigration. It's much more about an ideology. It's much more a kind of crusade to symbolize what it means to be a nation, what it means to be um, uh, a, a people, and part of this new nation, new peoplehood, is about excluding the other rather than embracing the other. So to pull this together then in terms of top and tailing this with some theological ideas just to, to throw out there, you know, um, a critical question is, you know, where does this leave us as Christian people? We have an immigration policy that is diametrically opposed to what we're called to believe and how we're called to act as people of God. What does it mean when one of the architects of this policy is a practicing Christian, going to church on Sunday, taking the communion, Monday enacting policies that brutalize some of the most vulnerable people in the country? Third thing that we need to consider is well, how do we get rid of this? How do we then change the way things are? This thing is really deeply embedded in our legal system. And 
it doesn't look like it's going to get any better for us because in 2017, when Sabid Javid was Home Secretary, he criticised the whole idea of the hostile policy uh, um, environment, but he didn't change it. He just rebranded it, rebranded it. He called it the compliant environment. Didn't really change it. So the third question is, if this is ungodly, what are we going to do to get rid of it? Hostile environment, Christian practice, I think we've been left on the starting blocks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robert. So I have a few questions here. I think I'm going to try and work backwards. So they're not going to be in order as they've come up. And I'm going to put two of these together initially because they have similar sentiments. Um, and they came up about the time that you were um, just talking about the different ways um, and the, the different um, processes that were affected by this policy. So one question is, is part of the hostile environment the onus of proof on the applicant, which is the reverse of the criminal law, when the onus of proof is on the Crown? So I guess we're talking about responsibility here. Um, the second question that is similar to this is, without undermining the injustices and hostilities faced by the immigrants, is there anything the Bible says about immigrants' conduct also when they go to settle down in other countries. So obviously these questions um, are looking at the, re the root responsibility here in this policy. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I, I might take them in reverse order. Um, the second one is a really difficult one for people of African heritage. How should people behave when they go into other people's countries? I say no more on that one. I uh, go to the first one. Um, I think that, um, you know, I'm interested in what the biblical text says. And for me, the sense there is on the emphasis upon the, uh, um, the, the onus of the inhabitants of the land to be inclusive and as just as possible. Um, if somebody breaks the law of the land, then they're subject to the laws of the land. But I'm kind of intrigued as to why the emphasis is upon law and abiding by the law rather than looking at the context in which many people have come from. Many migrants are, immigrants are displaced people, uh, refugees. Um, you know, so I'm intrigued by how we've made that reality a question uh, and focus on their illegal status or somehow buying into the discourse that they're here to take something that isn't theirs. Um, I mean, I'm just intrigued by the language, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not sure if I've answered either of them. I'm just kind of intrigued by the language. Um, and, yeah, it's interesting, I guess, because we're having a theological response, but talking about real time political issues that are affecting and dragging everybody into this conversation willingly and unwillingly. I guess for me and what I see with these questions is people trying to work out kind of where the lines are drawn. We have our theological responses, as you said, of love, of compassion, but then we have the practicalities of the running of the country. And really, I guess, what your talk has done and um, what I guess what we'll continue to do is really try to navigate how we can, or even to, I guess negotiate is the better word, how we can negotiate um, our actions and our reflections so that we actually have practical outgoings to this because people are thinking about practical policies. Um, we're talking about the context of suffering. We're talking about a bigger context of why we came here in the first place sure. as Caribbean sure. peoples, as the African diaspora, going even further back as well on our ongoing relationship um, with, um, with Britain. Um, and so I guess this is prompting some um, really interesting, <laughs> um, a, a really interesting, really thick and hard line, it seems, between our theological response, which could be on one side, and then the, uh, the, the practicalities of politics for this country. So another question I have here, is Quakers are working with other groups on the issue of renewal fees. Is there any way the churches can speak out loudly against these extortionate fees which they have, which have already been criticised in court judgments? Yeah, I think so. I think a united voice is important, but I think recent events have told us that 
protest has to be more than writing letters. It has to be coordinated, it has to be very public, and it has to be very action oriented. So I think Black Lives Matter and the recent anti-racism protests have raised the bar in terms of how we go about challenging the state and the kind of coordination that's necessary. So yes, I think that's vitally important. I think it's great that the Quakers and other groups have been doing work in this area. The question for them is how to publicize it, how to organize a broader alliance against it and how to literally take that to the streets. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And so this question, I'm not sure if this is um, a question for generally, it says, should we ask for reparations? Um, and so I'm also going to ask then, in terms of what has happened, what are your views about compensation, um, both uh, theologically and practically? Sure. <laughs> no, well, well, in the Old Testament, when the peace is broken, there's always um, some kind of restorative act. And in the New Testament, when uh, Philemon uh, loses his slave, Paul offers to, to repay. So the whole idea of reconciliation having an element within it, which is restitution, and that can be compensatory, is part of the Judeo-Christian tradition. So I think that we're, we're on good ground in terms of Christianity, believing in that. Um, you know, after I can even argue that the heart of the, um, uh, the death and resurrection is, is, a, is, a, is the idea of um, making right, of atoning. And atonement theology is complex, works out in, in different ways, kind of violent uh, in, in terms of our history. So we go with the non-violent approaches, but this, but this at the heart of it, is this idea of making right that which was damaged. Can you do it through financial compensation? Of course you can, because most of the gains made uh, through um, British colonialism, I can only speak about the Caribbean experience, were economic. So an economic exploitation requires economic uh, redress. How you do that in practice is a whole nother issue in terms of the mechanism of it. But I think that you can't have peace until you have that kind of justice. Look, Church of England had enslaved people in Barbados for over 100 years. I think they owe them, you know, more than an apology. Thank you. Okay, next question. How should churches remind congregations about our responsibility to welcome the stranger? Is preaching directly the best way, or is there some other ways local church leaders can do this? I think the easiest way to do it is to dress Jesus up, Jesus up as a refugee, because Jesus was a refugee in Egypt. African people saved him. You know, so I think it's the language that we have about who Jesus Christ is. Maybe we need to rethink our Christology and talk about Jesus in ways that resonate with Jesus, the, the marginality of the, the migrant, the stranger, because Jesus experienced that. It's that time in Egypt. So I think that's at the heart of it. We should maybe start talking about Jesus, the um, refugee uh, at Christmas time rather than Jesus meek and mild. So I think it's got a lot to do with language. I think the preaching and teaching plays a part. I think also the question is about welcome within the church, but there's another dimension to this. Churches are brilliant in this area when it comes to social welfare, looking after people, migrants, helping them with their paperwork, the food supply, well-being, psychological help, and brilliant. Not so good at the social justice, which is dismantling the, the law in the first place or reworking it so that it's much more just and that's the challenge to do the social justice work not just the social welfare work wonderful and so i'm interested i've got a question here but i'd like to ask a question about this question because it essentially says why the black story and not all the immigrant all immigrant story okay so what is your response to this all oh, lives completely, matter? Completely. <laughs> that's somebody else to tell you know, um, my, my story is um, specifically an African Caribbean story and I'm dealing with my own particular context and experience. But obviously, if you're talking about the experience of migration to Britain, it's complex, varied, contradictory, multicultural, hybrid. It is all of that. But I'm just using my own particular knowledge in this particular story to raise these particular points. I'm not saying it's universal, it's, con it's contextual, it's an individual, it's, it, it's particular. And hopefully we can find some universal points out of this particular experience. So yes, it's both and, not either or. Wonderful. And should Theresa May's vicar have challenged her? Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was Penny Costley with a backbench there. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I mean, hey, if it'd been African Pentecostal, they would have been having exorcism. Mm, no, I'm telling you. You know, so I mean, look, look uh, these policies, have destroyed families, destroyed people's lives. I know that in Northern European culture, 
northern west western european culture north atlantic culture there is a problem with seeing black people in pain mm -hmm. end of story theologians have written about it sociologists have written about it politicians have acknowledged it the church is yet to go to get its head straight on that black bodies in pain are not seen as bodies that we have to help and get out of the pain so you know for me part of the problem here is that um you know um we've still got to deal with our history in terms of christian theology that means that black bodies in pain are not taken as seriously as white bodies in pain so there's a lot to work through yeah. to get to the root of this mm -hmm. and so we're talking about we're talking about long time planning I guess when you said we've got a long way to go a lot has happened and there are also some other issues happening as well we've got the tearing down of the statues the black Lives matter movement marches um ongoing cases of uh, police brutality and and other issues here what can people listening to this webinar what can they take back to their church um present to their leaders present to their ministries what are the, what are the key questions that will stimulate movement and response um, it's a really good question. My stock question is that don't wait for the clergy. Do it yourself. Mm -hmm. If you feel the call, you do it. It's your, it's your responsibility. If the clergy have the vision or the moral courage, they'd be doing it now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it's not like the information isn't there. So my approach is that, uh, you know, to quote Foucault, the power comes from the bottom up, not from the top down. Mm -hmm. If you get the call and you've got the burning, then you pray for God's spirit and God's guidance to to move it on to the next level. If the pastor and the leaders will follow you, so be it. Um, if they don't, then, then you do what you've got to do. But I think if we're waiting for the clergy and the leadership to move, man, man, look, the Archbishop of Canterbury only said Jesus was black a couple of weeks ago. This was <laughs> yeah, the he didn't have blood. I mean, I can't wait 2,000 years to deal with this immigration policy. Mm -hmm. I can't wait for the church leaders to wake up to what it took African people 30 seconds to realize, you know, first century Palestinian Jew, it's a person of color. So I, I haven't got 2,000 years to wait for that. So I would say, you know, it's, it's for, uh, you know, if your ecclesiology is centered on the priesthood of all believers, that we as individuals have a call and have a mission, I would just run with the call. Um, if you can mobilize people in your church who want to be a part of it, then you do it. If you need the blessing of your leadership, and they'll give you, but I think it's about individuals with the, with the burning Mm -hmm. to, to do things rather than just relying on uh the the people at the top mm -hmm, indeed okay so we have another question here that says how do we retain the focus on black people's pain as we are always expected to re uh, to reach reconciliation without justice i think you've answered the question there i think that there's to quote Didier Bonho, there's cheap grace and there's costly grace and i think cheap grace is when we make the reconciliation when we do the kumbaya reconciliation we all hold hands have a little ceremony, not even a ceremony, sing a couple of songs in church, pastor says we all love each other and that's it, without doing the hard work of um, reconciliation, which in terms of race, although we're talking about immigration, immigration is very much linked with issues around race, the, the, the two discourses are not separate. We've got to deal with three areas. One, we've got to look at the way in which the Bible actually helps or doesn't help with um, understanding ethnic diversity and inclusion and how we've read it to support and not support um, inclusion. Um, I think there's also dealing with our own cultural history in terms of Britain and recognizing and dealing with that. And thirdly, uh, we'd have to re educate the congregation because part of the problem is, in terms of Christian history, we start with, uh, you know, Genesis or, you know, three and a bit thousand years ago. We work to the, the you know, to Jesus. Uh, then we get into the church fathers a few mothers knocking around but we don't necessarily mention them and then um you know we end up with the reformation and then we end up in the 18th century so it's kind of like a 300 year gap in the christian um uh history in britain and, and that's the christian history where the christians go overseas so that history is kind of missing and i think until we foreground that missing history and work out the theology that happened overseas it's very difficult to understand the predicament that we're in right now um, and we don't reflect on it. You know, one of my party tricks and with students is to say, go to the library and find all the books you can find written on race and theology, uh, one, two, written in the last 100 years. I think that says everything. Do you have any recommendations? 
Um, he, well, yeah, the only books that really write, are, the only people who write about John Wilkinson's book, 1994, The Church in Black and White. There's a book by um, Ken Leach, Christi uh, Church and Racism, that doesn't necessarily deal with some of the theological ideas in a big way. Um, and that's about it in terms of theologians racialized as white. You're talking about the black folk, well, then it's different because we, you know, we, we, we write about this stuff, but mm -hmm. I'm kind of intrigued. But our stuff doesn't necessarily make it onto the curriculum and it doesn't necessarily fill the gaps in uh, uh, seminaries. So it's a big crisis. If Kahindi Andrews is correct, Kahindi Andrews, professor of black studies, he argues that institutions that aren't explicitly anti-racist and who can't demonstrate that in their teaching and in their uh, content, they're producing racism. Mm. Yeah, just, well, our seminaries in Britain, apart from maybe one where there's an interest in this stuff, uh, using Kim, Kim Andrews me metrics, you would say our seminaries are producing racism, not resist resisting it. So, so I think that's, that's it, 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 it's not rocket science. People have been talking about these things for 70 years. Not everybody's listening. Mm -hmm. And so my question, and this is just um, more of a reflection of my age and my political passivity over the years, which is probably due to my religious upbringing. When we are having these theological reflections and engaging directly with the politics of the country, does it require us to take sides in terms of parties? Or can we develop these theological responses, these actions, which are really important to me, as, alongside the, that ongoing <laughs> battle between the polit political parties? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Well, I'm from Coventry, so I don't trust any party. <laughs> okay. uh, so yeah, it's part of the Coventonian mentality and outlook. Mm -hmm. But I, I think what is clear is that the biblical text requires us to be prophetic to speak truth to power, whether it's left or right. Mm -hmm. We have an agenda which is a kingdom agenda, which is agen an agenda grounded in the love of God and the example set by Jesus Christ. And that is, that's our politics. Mm -hmm. Our manifesto is Jesus' manifesto. And we, we, we engage with whoever, uh, whichever political party. I think uh, it's very difficult to take any, any side. There might be mm -hmm. uh, 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 one side you have policies that you favor, but I think ultimately, it's about that prophetic witness, which we find in the eighth century prophet speaking truth to power, challenging the injustice, making sure that the society is much more equitable. How you get there might depend on your politics, whether it's left or right or centrist, but mm -hmm. the ambition, the Christian ambition has to be the constant. That's right. Okay, so question here, should Christians also sell the benefits of immigration? We wouldn't have been able to cope with COVID-19 without first and second generation in the healthcare service and care homes, for instance. Yeah, completely, and I think we could go back even long, uh, you know, uh, more than post-war. Uh, you know, I, I went to school with kids whose families have been here from from Ireland. You know, uh, uh, well before uh, the 1940s, I, I had friends who were who were Jewish who told me about their family's history at the uh, turn of the century when they came to Britain. You know, there's a long history of migration in Britain from diverse parts of the world, Europe uh, in particular. So, you know, it, it's kind of um, the, the idea of there being a, you know, a, a, a homogeneous group of people who've been here from day one, is it necessarily true? I think what's important is this, is, is there within Christianity a discourse or understanding of what it means to be human and what it means to embrace the other which displaces this insider-outsider um, dynamic that Brexit and to an extent the hostile environment has created. And I think I want to go with the Christian approach, which is to see people as people in need, as my brother or sister, and give them the benefit of the doubt. I think that's more the Christian way. How you work that to in terms of policy when you've, you've created an environment where you're meant to be distrustful of the other, then I think that, that love motif becomes really, really problematic. So that, that's, that's the challenge. You know, we've created a, an, a hostile environment where that hostility spills over and brutalizes people. And I'm interested in developing a counter discourse. And what that means in terms of an immigration policy, I'm not completely sure. Uh, um, in terms of numbers or, or practice, but I know the ethos has to be different. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really interesting, actually, also that we're talking about immigration um, with the hostile environment, but really in our context and in 
we're talking about black British people, <laughs> people that are actually British, you know, they haven't just a, a lot of people that have been, um, you know, imprisoned, deported, have been here for such a long time and they came as British people. And sometimes I feel that that gets lost in this whole conversation, especially yeah. when it's broadened out into people of other nations. Well, sure, yeah. Well, there was the whole Windrush scandal, which showed how uh, uh, callous uh, and brutal the hostile environment policy was. They just did not recognise that there were a group of people who came here who's, who were never meant to have official paperwork um, because they, they just weren't meant to be here long term and who came under a different regime and who for a variety of reasons weren't able to get their, their citizenship in, in, in order in the way that the government required and who were caught up in this. And there were some terrible stories, um, well-documented stories about people who got caught up in the, the whole Windrush scandal. But what it does say to us is, again, um, you know, uh, what should we be foregrounding as the values for an immigration policy as Christian people? Whether you want 10,000 people coming in a year or a million people or whatever, there has to be a set of values that undergird it. And for me, the hostile environment, whether you're left or centre or right or centre, is not Christian. Mm -hmm. It really just is not. I can't see, I don't read in the Bible where you're taking away people's livelihoods and um, opportunity to flourish while you're evaluating whether or not they should stay in the country or not, or putting people, really, really vulnerable people, in even more vulnerable circumstances. I, I, I don't see that as being part of the Christian tradition. So I think, you know, what I've tried to say and, and get at in this, is, this talk is that the principles upon which it rests, the values, are unchristian. You know, you can, can have a stringent immigration policy, but it can have values that are more humane, that are more just, that are more loving, that are more compassionate. Indeed. Wonderful. It's been very stimulating, very exciting. These questions have been very, very varied, obviously showing, um, the, I guess, the different perspectives on this. And I think one thing I'll definitely walk away from with so I walk away with is getting back to those uh, the narrative of welcoming the stranger into um, our communities having compassion having love and no what no matter where you sit whether you're right you're left you're centrist your internal theological policies are they guided by the kingdom narrative by Jesus Christ and by our understanding of scripture so I want to thank you so much Robert for today it's been my pleasure. It's been Are we done already? My goodness, I was just warming up. <laughs> let's see if we've got any more questions. Okay, we're getting some more. Let's keep going then. Okay. We were running a bit dry, but this is it's coming on. How as Christians can we promote global citizenship education? Um, I think that's a really good question, and I think it begins with the language that we use in church. I think we have to use the language, a language which is so inclusive that em embrace embraces those who are in the church and outside of the church. We've got to start talking about all of God's children being of equal value and equal worth and having that exhibited at every operation of church life. That's where it becomes really important. If you can find a way in which in your leadership team, it reflects that inclusion so that, um, you know, often uh, black and brown people are, uh, are found doing, the, the, you know, often dominate the music scene don't necessarily dominate the leadership team. I think, it's, I think it's a language and a practice that demonstrates that there's an alternative, a powerful redemptive alternative mm -hmm. uh, um, for, for um, uniting people than what we see um, in the world or in government policy in the hostile environment. So I think it's about, pra it's not just about saying, it, it's about doing the right stuff and presenting the right stuff to the world as an alternative. I always get kind of confused when I go into churches and I hear discourse on love and inclusion and there's like an apartheid in terms of the leadership. Mm. It makes me wonder, well, um, if all of God's children are being called here and are being equally loved and supported, how, how come some of them can't make it up to the top? Yeah. Which raises questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question here is, why are the government keen to make space for Hong Kong residents but hostile to others? Politics and stereotype. Politics because they want to uh, be on the right side of Trump in terms of the battle with China and because the stereotype is that a, um, a, a million Hong Kongese uh, will be more desirable than say a million people from the Congo. So I think there's a kind of colonial imagination uh, at work in terms of part of this as well as the kind of new geopolitical 
world in which we live in, where there is an emerging Cold War between the West and China. Great. So what do you see as the Home Office's current stance on refugee and asylum seeker applications? Um, are they still doing it? I don't know if they're COVID, I thought they're taking a break. Um, but I think the whole thing is broken. Mm -hmm. And it, it's broken in terms of the system they've created. If you've got a, a system that's had to refer itself to scrutiny from the race relations, well, the race relations by, you know, um, uh, uh, because people think it's racist and the government itself thinks it might be racist, it, it, it's broken. So I think we have to find a completely new way of um, imagining what nationhood, what immigration looks like. And one thing that we have to do is take race out of it, because for most of my life, it's been about race. There's been no separation between discourses of immigration and discourses of, of race. Immigrant usually means somebody who's black and brown, uh, mm -hmm. rather than somebody who's from Australia or New Zealand or Canada. Um, so I think we just have to find a new way of imagining the process. And one of the things that some governments are doing now is introducing this point system. I'm not sure whether or not that's going to solve the problem because not everybody, um, you know, it, it just usually sucks the skills out of countries where they can, where they really need those people. So it just needs a whole new imagining in terms of placing our needs alongside the needs of some of the most uh, desperate parts of the world in this point in time where people are, are trying to, trying to leave so I think you have to put immigration policy inside of the, the kind of global uh, foreign policy because the two are so intimately related. Great okay now we've got loads of questions coming in I'm going to do my best to get through them all. So do you think that without the opportunity to stop and think provided uh, by the Covid lockdowns everybody kind of being you know, under house arrest as it were that George Floyd's death would have just passed by unnoticed? Possibly Possibly. I think that undoubtedly it's one of the factors. I think the eight minutes and 46 seconds of tape also made an impact. I think a few days earlier, having a, a nerdy black guy watching birds being um, uh, victimised by somebody uh, who called the police, remember the, the um, uh, Central Park bird watcher. I think all of that uh, in, uh, uh, helped to escalate what happened in terms of the, the protest. But we also need to acknowledge that the work of Black Lives Matter, uh, other anti-racist bodies around the world within the UK, you can't undermine the significance of their work. And also the brave uh, people who have spoken out consistently over the last few years, um, you know, Raheem Sterling, uh, you know, he may not support Man City, but he's been there in terms of sticking his head above the parapet and has made it possible for people like Lewis Hamilton to stand up and be counted, you know? I need a real Ferdinand saying too much when he was a player about racism. All of a sudden he's an anti-racism champion, you know? So I think we have to acknowledge that there have been people who have been at the forefront of this uh, and not just sporting people, people who are hidden behind the scenes working in, in small offices and getting no praise for their anti-racism work, you know? So, I mean, we, we've got to give them credit for creating a discourse where it is possible for people to understand that this kind of thing is unacceptable and that you have to defeat it. Enough is enough. Mm -hmm, that's right. Okay, so what practical things can we do to help churches to address their own institutional racism? I think there are four key things. First thing, you need to train the clergy. You know, um, if your clergy is like most clergy, they couldn't tell the difference between Marcus Rashford and Marcus Garvey. You know, we are we have clergy who are uneducated when it comes to issues around race, racism, and the biblical text. We need to re reclaim the clergy and, and admit the solipsism, the institutionalization of ignorance when it comes to issues of race. And that, that, that's, that's straightforward. And if you can't acknowledge that, we're really stuck at, at square one. I think the second thing that comes out of that is to educate the congregation, you know? And one of the ways in which we, we can do that is rethink the songs that we sing because we don't sing too many songs about racial justice and what God has to say about inclusion, uh, what God has to say about um, people who find themselves always on the outside. I mean, how many songs that we have in our canon uh, that deal explicitly with the last 70 years? I asked this one a few weeks ago, somebody said, oh, that song about the darkness, pushing back the darkness. 
I said, well, <laughs> maybe not the, uh, the colour coding in that. <laughs> yeah. It's problematic, but I, I know what you're trying to say. So, I mean, you know, we, we, we could use the discourses of the church to educate the people. So I think, I think that's the second thing, educating the clergy, educating the congregation. I think the third thing, to be quite biblical, is repentance, because we have to acknowledge that we haven't done what we should have done. And that's always gives, but provides an opportunity for new beginnings, new opportunities. And, and the fourth thing I think is we need radical action. Uh, you know, talking about it isn't good enough. Mm -hmm. uh, the evidence is there, the knowledge is there, the steps to be taken are there. It's acting and creating uh, an environment within in the church that is, is truly inclusive. Um, it requires radical decision making so that the leadership represents the body uh, and, and that there are, um, you know, that the, the, when people go into a, a, a place of worship and into a church, they can see that there is a, a distribution of opportunities for all of the people within the church. So yeah, I think that that's, that's the action part. Just act, just do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Isn't there a dilemma with standing for Christian values when Christians are increasingly a minority in a secularized society? How can our voice be heard and be effective when we are only a small minority? Well, you know, my mother always used to say, one with God is a majority. And what she meant by that was, if you truly believe that you serve the creator of the universe, the, the God who um, is all powerful, all knowing, then just standing alongside that, 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 belief system gives you a certain authority and a certain power and a certain prophetic witness. And that's what I've always worked with within my own um, uh, uh, um, profession and my, own, my understanding of what it means to be a Christian. You just not everybody's going to go with this, but if you're, if you believe God's called you to do it, you do it. But in term, but that isn't completely true because there aren't many countries in the world where there are Christians in, in parliament, in the, in the, in the uh, highest echelons of power and the houses of um, um house of lords so there is real influence the archbishop of canterbury still has real influence and you know even if you were to get christian groups to act collectively that's still a, quite a powerful pressure group mm -hmm. even outside of the spirituality and the power of the holy spirit to transform that's still a powerful group so i wouldn't yet discount the influence and role of christians as transformative agents within this world i think there is a vision and a perspective that comes out of the christian gospel that still has resonance and transforming power for the world today you know and um you know the evidence shows that christian people are just more likely to be involved in doing stuff anyway so you know people who would do stuff have a prophetic mandate still have in this country reach into the echelons of power that's that's, that's a certain kind of um you know, uh, um, a technology for change that Christians have. And I think maybe we just need to harness that a bit more. Mm -hmm. So do you think training for church leadership should include special training on cultural relations and how the scriptures can be used by them when they are educating their members? Yeah, completely. We need to decolonize how we read the Bible, decolonize Christian theology, decolonize ministry, decolonize ministry of training, and you'll have a decolonized um, church environment. Uh, will that ever happen? Some churches will do it if they want to be truly Christian, but we have to acknowledge there's a lot that's been invested in maintaining racial hierarchy in the church. Mm -hmm. So many people got upset when the Archbishop of Canterbury said that the first century Palestinian Jew didn't look like Charleston, Charleston Heston. I was shocked. What are you saying? We've got to look at what's been invested in, in we've got to look at the way in which white supremacy, white skin colour privilege has been so ingrained within Christian thought, Christian practice, that it's very difficult to separate them without mm -hmm. people feeling. So, so I think these things can happen, but we need to be honest about how hard it will be for some people because of how much has been invested in maintaining the status quo. And so following on from that, how can we help older church members in age to reimagine an inclusive church and society? That's a good question. Um, I think that you have to build relationships and go on a journey with people. And if people are open and willing to hear and listen, then there's always the possibility for change. Part of the problem is that uh, black and brown people don't get listened to you know, until it's too late. 
So if we stand up and say, look, there's a problem here because of X, Y, and Z, the chances are it won't get heard. So people have to be willing to, willing to listen, embrace it, and roll with it. And if you're building a relationship with people where, who, who want to be on that journey, then uh, you know, anything is possible. Okay. So this question is about relationships as well. And um, it says, do you think that sometimes people of colour or other ethnic groups can add to the hostility by their own attitude? Maybe they have a chip on their shoulder from the past which needs to be dealt with. Well, I think that's a problematic question because mm -hmm. I think that if you're not angry about racism, then you're not human. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think chip on the shoulder is a metaphor for saying that, uh, not metaphor, it's, it's, it's the way in which we discredit the pain and suffering that people have been through. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I have a real problem with that, with that language. But mm -hmm. uh, I think that given what we know about the impact of racism on mental health, it can make you mad. Mm -hmm. uh, people are experiencing that and they're, un and they're unhappy or they're sick or they're angry then you know that's that's something that we have to take seriously and that that goes more onto your point also about language and and how powerful language is as well because often when i have conversations about when people ask me as well about black people's attitude and the chip on the shoulder it's almost some as if they believe you know it can just be brushed off um, and that it can be gotten over um, and there's kind of just a real <clears throat> lack of understanding sometimes about the depth of the feelings and the pain um, and so going back to, um, this is a question actually about the music, the songs, one of your suggestions. Where can I get hold of songs about justice and kinds of issues? Oh, that's <laughs> easy. Just get my album. It's free to download. Free to that's download. Cool. Jamaican Bible Remix. We even uploaded it on YouTube the other day so people could access it more easily than on the uh, university website. Jamaican Bible Remix. Um, it is a, uh, an album uh, inspired by the Jamaican New Testament. And the songs that are constructed are uh, political, theological narratives around parts of the biblical text. So that will give you some insight. Look, I, I can't sing. I'll be completely honest with you. Well, look, I can, but they say I'm just about two percent off Luther Vandross. And I wanted to be better than Luther Vandross. So <laughs> um, you know, but what I do do is I work with musicians and artists who are big in the gospel scene to try and do that. It's called the Jamaican Bible Remix. So we had really to go and doing that. There are a few artists who have woken up to this reality since um, the death of George Floyd. So I think there is a single doing the rounds at the moment by um, one, gospel, one British gospel, Noel Thompson. Is, has got a, a, a single out at the moment, uh, which um, attempts to, which is a reworking of his song for Haiti, uh, which attempts to deal with in, injustice. But these are gospel songs, not necessarily church choruses. And we have a deficit of church choruses that reflect on social justice in quite specific and contextual ways. And I think that's problematic. So the only album I know that attempts to do this in history is the drum by Sounds of Blackness. That's the only major gospel album which attempted to do this back in the early 90s. And they are, you know, an ensemble that get together every now and then and produce some fantastic gospel music. And their album, The Journey of the Drum, is, is, is to date the only gospel album which attempts to raise social justice, political, economic questions and place them in dialogue with the Christian gospel. What does God have to say about what does the Bible say? What's God have to say about this, especially in terms of the history of African, African Caribbean people, African diaspora and people. So I'd recommend those two albums to you. Mine is free, but you have to buy theirs. <laughs> so download that one tonight. And do you think there's any mileage in um, borrowing into Rastafari uh, music? Um, and, well, I think, I think that if you have a view of the sacred and secular as not being separated, which is a, a, a reality in terms of African culture, Caribbean culture, then you look for wherever God is speaking and you appropriate that, that knowledge where, wherever it comes from. And so for some people who work with that kind of spiritual cosmology, it's, it's easier then to dip into non-traditional or non-Christian um, context for ideas uh, and, and, and you know that's my, my experience so yeah I think there was some really powerful spiritual music that engages with social justice questions of immigration questions of the hostile environment but they're they're spoken about and sung about in in hip-hop genres 
and in reggae music genres. I don't think Stormzy should be the one criticising uh, corrupt government policies in song. I think it should be part of the, the, the mainstream Christian tradition as well. I'm not that I've got anything against Stormzy. I know he listens into the Church of Brother in Britain of Ireland all the time. He's a big fan. So look, Stormzy, I'm not having a, a go at you. I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just the messenger. Fair enough. And um, do you have any examples of churches that are doing your four points that you mentioned earlier, or at least some of them? So any examples that people can learn from bring no. to their churches? No, no. I've not seen one. None. People don't listen to this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, none. None. I mean, you can look at the way in which, look at the fallout from George Floyd in terms of church life in Britain. A pastor's resigning over racism. So a pastor a large um, uh, international uh, church hill song get into trouble by not having the language or the understanding, but at least having the guts to acknowledge it afterwards. Mm -hmm. It suggests to me that we've got a long way to go. And, th and then afterwards with the hill song, when he put up a picture of all these black people singing, you know, um, uh, to kind of um, deflate uh, that. <laughs> I mean, so it seems to me there's a long, there's a long way to go with this. And what worries me is that there isn't the moral courage mm -hmm. to do the work and that's what worries me most is that um to do to go on this journey requires a real commitment and i'm not sure if that commitment is is there just yet mm -hmm. so i can't think of any i'm sure that some of my research students will probably correct me and say yes it's happening here though but i i i haven't seen it in anything that my research students have produced or things i've read or seen mm -hmm. I'm sure somebody will come up with an, uh, an alternative. I, I would presume that this is normative in Ben Lindsay's church. I presume that he's got to grips with those four points and more, I, I would expect. I haven't visited. Uh, he hasn't given me an invitation to preach. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but I would presume that's normative. I would expect that to be normative in uh, his fellowship. Yeah, or at least the start and the beginning workings of that. So now our time is truly up. <laughs> okay. Forgive me for my false ending um, oh, earlier, yes. but it's been excellent, absolutely excellent. I'm really um, happy with all the questions that have come through from all the different perspectives. I think it's kind of good to keep um, the Q&A really rounded. Um, and so I would like to end just by reminding people that this hasn't just been a deeply theoretical, high and lofty conversation. Robert has given us four points that we can walk away with. Train the clergy educate the congregation and consider the songs that we use um, in our liturgy. Um, repentance, congregational church leadership and individual repentance of complicity and then radical action. It's not enough to talk, it's not enough to think or to feel, there must be action after this reflection. And so we thank you so much for engaging with us tonight. Thank you so much once again, Robert, for giving us your precious time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Alicia. Um, and thank you Church Together in Britain and Ireland and uh, the Baptist Union as well. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So keep an eye out for um, future webinars. The, there is one next week. Um, so come back to the website, take a look, and definitely engage. I hope to see you again soon. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.